This week, we share our first impressions of the 2022 Genesis GV70, how we learned some important information on getting brakes changed at a dealership, and how a talking car's audience question led to changes at the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, next on Talking Cars. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode. I'm Mike Monticello. I'm Alex Nizek. And I'm Jennifer Stockberger. So we're going to start off this week kind of circling back to a few topics we talked about on a couple of recent episodes. And the first one uh, has to do with Mazda's active safety systems and the IHS ratings. Jen, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the result was with that? Right. So, so the original question came from Tariq on episode 316, where he was asking about the um, active safety systems between the Mazda CX-5 and the Subaru Forester, which he had kind of narrowed down as cars he wanted to, for himself to drive, but also share with his younger son. So in my answer, I shared the, some of the ratings from the IHS um, on on both of those vehicles. And in particular, he was concerned um, or asking, is the dual system, the camera and radar on the Mazda, better than the camera only system on the Subaru? So I shared the IHS ratings that are slightly better for the Subaru system, camera only, including the fact that Mazda did not get credit for its forward collision warning system on the IHS's ratings. So fast forward, Mazda sees that they do some outreach to us, and as it turns out, Mazda has fixed that forward collision warning system timing and should have been getting credit on IIHS's site for having it. Mazda reaches out to IIHS, IIHS updates the ratings, and the Mazda CX-5 now gets credit for that forward collision warning system, making their ratings slightly better. So, when I, it was funny because I'm sure Tariq didn't realize when he wrote the question that it was going to have upstream impact all the way up to the IHS altering the ratings for the CX-5. So Tariq, and for anybody else who thinks they might have a question that doesn't apply to others, please ask it. Um, it you know, Tariq, your question went right through Mazda, right to the IHS. That has been updated. I would say the Subaru's ratings are still slightly higher for its camera-only system, but new ratings for the Mazda CX-5 for forward collision warning. So thank you, Tariq. And also, uh, thanks, Mazda, yes. for watching our podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, now we're going to talk about, um, so last episode, episode 317, we talked, uh, one of our topics was, you know, what SUVs do we think are going to be classic down the road? You know, we always talk about classic cars, uh, you know, and, and how uh, valuable they are. And, and, and we know what those cars are, but what about SUVs? And so we got a, a lot of good responses from you guys. Besides the picks that we gave you for, from us, you guys sent in a bunch. And so we're just going to read a few right here, uh, some of the more interesting ones. Janet says, for an idea of a future classic small SUV crossover, I've always thought there was something unique and appealing about my 2015 Infiniti QX50. I'm a fan of the curvy body styling and the dashboard is very elegant and traditional. Just as a side note, if you're not familiar with the QX50, uh, it's what Infiniti used to call the EX before they switched over to this all Q uh, naming system. The EX was essentially a raised version of, of the G series sedan. Uh, we got another comment here. The FJ Cruiser and Defender were the two SUVs that came to mind when I thought of future classics as they're pretty much already classics. Uh, that's the Toyota FJ Cruiser, the Land Rover Defender, which uh, both Quincy, Mike Quincy and uh, Ryan talked about last week as their picks. Gerard from Terrytown, New York says, I think some Jeep Gladiators will make the list, especially the manual transmission ones. It's harder to decide which of the current crop of vehicles will generate enough nostalgia to become the equivalent of a 1960s Mustang or Volkswagen Type 2 bus. What do you guys think? Gladiator maybe down the road? Yeah, I think it could be, especially with the manual, right? It's one of the more uh, less common versions of a Wrangler. So, yeah, I could see that. Yeah, and I think unique body styles, uh, now, and when we talk about my picks, that's somewhat of what goes into the classic equation. Because it's different than other vehicles on the right. road. Right. right. Okay, Donald says, the 1984 to 2001 Jeep XJ Cherokee is also an SUV that's been appreciating the last few years. A nice, clean, unmodified one might also be collectible as well. And when you think about it, the Cherokee was really one of the first SUVs. Uh, and plus, it's got the benefit of it is it is actually uh, a, a pretty good off-roader. 
Yeah, and they're getting hard to find in that Are nice they? condition. They've all oh yeah, they've all been trashed at this point or, or rotted away, so they're getting harder to find. So I think that that's spot on. Yeah. Yeah, because they weren't that expensive, you know, when you bought them new. So it, unfortunately, mm-hmm. sometimes when, when vehicles aren't that expensive, people don't take, they don't, don't always have as much pride in them. They don't take yeah. such great care. And of course, they're pretty old by now. All right. Nicholas says crossovers aren't in the discussion regarding future classics because they're mostly very similar and most are bland, characterless appliances. Nicholas, thanks for <laughs> thanks for telling it like it is. I mean, <laughs> it's just going straight. You guys agree with that? Um, I think, I think in in a way, yes, but you know, just like any car, it's, um, it's the unique versions of the crossovers or the, the, the ones that stand out that might, um, gain attention later. So actually thinking about what Janet said about infinity, I thought about the infinity QX 45, I think it is with the V8 and it's this like kind of coopy crossover and an early crossover. So something like that, where they're not very common, have something unique about them. And I think, you know, given enough time, they'll, they'll get popular again. And, and I, yeah, I think that the, the different ones, again, going back to the unique body styles, and I think I might have shared this on a previous episode. How about the Ford Flex? So I, you know, I love Here that Here we go with Jen again with the Ford Flex. <laughs> and how about the, um, the element? We also talked about the element, the which element, yeah. Keith kind of indicated that's already becoming hard to find and a cool classic, very functional cars. But you know what? I have a question for you guys. I have a lot of questions in this episode, but Uh-oh. do you think as cars get more electrify, uh, not electrify, but um, electronics over the air updates, all of these, is it going to be harder to have a classic? I think of my, you know, they alluded to the 60s Mustang. So simple. It's easy to keep that classic. Is it going to mm-hmm. be harder to have a classic car with all those electronics in it? Um, Yeah, I mean, even with a classic car, it depends if it's a really popular one like a Mustang and they keep making parts, whether it's Ford right. or, or other companies, you know, kind of pick up the the slack, if you will, and, and start making parts. And that's one thing. So I think, yeah, if, if the software stops being supported or the parts, you know, don't get made. And uh, yeah, you're going to have a hard time, I think. Yeah, but it's parts, but those can be reproduced and get reproduction parts. It's the software. So I'm I'm interested to see what happens Mm -hmm. when I'm an old woman. Older. (laughs) Don't say anything. What do you mean when? Older. Older. Quiet. You mean you mean the simplicity of the Mustang simplicity of that's what you're kind of partially talking about that, you know, like, you know, those cars you could work on yourself and And it just seems like it's getting more and more complicated with the newer cars, right? Is that what you're sort of saying, Jen? And you could get parts, physical yeah. hardware, as right, opposed right. to electronics or software. Yes. Gotcha. Well, anyway, uh, we're glad you guys enjoyed that segment. Thanks for sending in uh, all the good comments and uh, keep them coming. We'll, we'll still keep talking about them down the road. So uh, let's move on to our next segment. We're going to talk uh, this week at the test track. The 2022 Genesis GV70. Uh, these are our first impressions of this vehicle. Uh, the GV70 comes on the heels of the GV80, which we've already tested and uh, in general liked liked uh, quite a bit. Uh, and the GV80 was the Genesis brand's first SUV. Now the GV70, slightly smaller, comes along. Uh, if you don't know, Genesis is the, is the luxury arm of Hyundai along the lines of, you know, Acura to Honda, uh, Infiniti to uh, Nissan and Lexus to Toyota. And so if you think of the GV70, competitors were th- talking like a BMW X3. That's about the size that this yep. vehicle is aimed at. It shares its powertrain. I thought this was really interesting. It shares its powertrains with the larger GV80. So you're talking about the same turbo four cylinder, the same turbo V6, yet in a smaller package. I mean, right there, that's a recipe for good performance. Uh, so there's a 300 horsepower turbo four cylinder, a 375 horsepower turbo V6 uh, available in rear or all wheel drive. Eight speed automatic transmission comes on all of them. We rented two GV70s from Genesis. Uh, So we could do both powertrains and base prices range from 41,000 to 52,600. Alex, we're going to start with you. Sure. What is it like, uh, you know, a smaller version basically of the GV80, this GV70, what's, how does that affect its cornering ability? And also did they get the ride to handling compromise, right? Yeah, I I was pretty impressed when I first drove this, Um, we drove the 2.5 turbo first and, you know, I think they they really nailed um, the ride and handling balance, in my opinion. And and Jen, I think you said it. They uh, the ride handling and powertrain really define this vehicle. 
Um, I found it genuinely fun to drive, you know, and not just for a crossover for actually just any car. Very fun to drive. You know, the steering is direct, but it doesn't feel darty. It's got a good weight to it. And then it feels, you know, rear wheel drive, even though the one we drove was uh, all wheel drive. It's a rear wheel drive architecture. And you could really tell when you when you drove it through, you know, the twisty Connecticut roads and all that type of thing. Um, but talking about the balance, you know, it uh, it stays planted through the corners and it, it kind of has a firm edge to it, but it still manages to absorb the bumps really well and be comfortable. And I just I do think they struck a, a really nice balance there. Yeah, I I totally agree. I mean, uh, I I also uh, took it, took it on the track, our test track as well, and you can feel that rear drive balance of the car. Like you said, even though it was all wheel drive, you know, if you turn it into a corner really hard and let off the throttle, and you can get the rear to kind of step out a little bit. I mean, obviously the stability control takes care of all that, but just the fact that you can do that as opposed to just kind of plowing or understeering through the turns, they, they really right. really. Uh, tuned this car to be a sporty driver and man it, you really you really feel like it what about what about the um the turbo four like do you think uh our our buyers who go with the turbo four instead of the turbo v6 obviously you're going to be uh having a fuel mileage uh improvement and it's going to cost a little less are they yep. is there how much of a penalty are they paying in a sense performance wise by going with the turbo four instead of the turbo v6 yeah. Um, I mean, you said it in your um, intro of the car, right? These are direct carryover engines from the larger GV80 and not detuned at all. So you're still getting, you know, 300 horsepower out of the turbo four. And I think in this thing, it it is excellent. It's a ton of power. Um, you know, it's smooth. There was only a couple instances where, you know, maybe the power delivery could have been a little smoother, but the transmission is great and shifts smoothly. Um but, you know, like you said, we rented the the V6 as well, and it kind of almost it really feels like a hot rod in that in that car. It is a lot of power for a smaller SUV. And um, I think if you want that type of thing, great. And you're going to enjoy that that extra power. But anybody who chooses the the four cylinder turbo is is not going to be disappointed, in my opinion. Oh, I was just going to say, if if I had never driven the V6 in either car, the GV80 or the mm-hmm. G, I would be completely happy with the with the four cylinder totally and and you only go oh well that was but the the four cylinder is plenty for most people mm-hmm. i think and and i actually like that little bit of firm edge on the ride uh, that to me is much more appealing than something that's far more floaty I, I agree with you that like the the v6 just has a little bit more it's it's not not like world's more power i mean you know it, and again it's not it's 75 more horsepower which is not a mm-hmm. ton but you just feel a little bit more everywhere right and it just has a little deeper well of power a little nicer note too uh, what I liked for both vehicles is when you put it in its sport mode, the shifts become faster and kind of really crisp. I mean, so, you know, sometimes with these sport modes, it's like, oh, well, they just, you know, it just holds the gears a little longer. But this one, I just, I liked that if you wanted that, you've got this now crisp, sporty shifting uh, transmission feel, which was pretty neat. Alex, let's talk about controls, because this was an area of the GV80 that we weren't happy with. Uh, they were kind of confusing, not that uh, intuitive. Did they do a better job with the GV70? The the GV70 is better, but it's still not, it's not worlds better. And I think if it still suffers from a lot of the um, shortcomings that the, the GV80 has. And so it's the same, you know, large landscape touchscreen display. And thankfully it is touch enabled up there on the dash. But the problem with that is they put it so far away that they're really encouraging you to use a dial that they have on the center console to interact with the screen. And the main problem with the GV80 is that it was this like really flush dial. You kind of felt like a disc jockey or something trying to spin this thing on the <laughs> on the dash or on the center console rather. So in the 70, they turned it into a raised up knob style thing that looks like kind of what you get with a BMW iDrive system. So you're pushing and rotating and pressing this thing. And it's better. It is better. But the software side of things hasn't changed. So that's still can be confusing to navigate around and then the also the problem with the knob is that it's now right next to the gear selector knob and they both look very similar feel similar so i know i did it i don't know about you guys but i accidentally grabbed the you know infotainment dial instead of the gear shift knob at one point so you know can take some getting used to or even if you're not paying you know close attention could maybe be an issue yeah it looks looks nice looks fancy but oh yeah you know, the important thing really should be 
you know, how easy is it to use, especially while you're driving? Jen, uh, what were some thoughts uh, on your end about the GV70? Maybe some things that are kind of unique that stood out to you about it. Yeah. So, so one, my, again, I told you I had a lot of questions. So my first <laughs> question, and I was literally looking at them side by side, GV80, GV70, is the handling difference? So my question, if you're spending forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 anyway, why would you not get the GV80? Is the handling to you guys that much with the smaller package that much better? I was just like, why would you not get the additional cargo, um, the optional third row? I was just like, why would I get a GV70 over a GV80? And don't get me wrong, love love the powertrains on both. I've got some opinions, but uh, um, Alex, why don't, why don't you go first? And let's 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 set Jen straight. Generous of you. <laughs> I, I think you're right. They are they are pretty close. Uh, but I did appreciate that the GV70 doesn't, at least to me, quite feel like only a mini GV80. You know, sometimes when you go like BMW shopping, you're kind of just choosing a size, not to pick on BMW, but that's true for a lot of brands. Um, so it did feel a little different to me. And I think, you know, the suspension feels like it's set up similar, but because the car is a little lower, it's not quite as tall. It's, um, you know, it's a little lighter for sure. So it's not like the handling was so much better that it was an obvious choice, but I think without needing that extra space, it's, it's different enough for me that, um, you know, I can, I can see it and it, it looks different. The styling is different. So I think, um, there's a little bit there that, that would make you choose the 70 over the 80. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, you know, if you need the space go with the GV80, uh, but I do think the GV70 has a little nicer, sharper handling feel. And actually, I think in some ways it actually r- rides better, at least, the ones we rented versus the one we bought of the GV80. So we'll have to see. We're, we're going to be buying a GV70 very, any day now. But I actually thought in some ways it actually rode better. Maybe that had to do with different wheel sizes. You know, again, it all has to do the wheels affect these SUVs so much. But I thought I was kind of impressed with how well the GV70 rode. But I, I see your point, Jen, for sure. A couple of things I just want to add. Um, I do think it's these big things, the ride, the powertrain, the, you know, that are going to lure people into the GV70 or mm-hmm. 80. Um, but it's some of the niceties that I think will keep them uh, outside of the controls. And I hope they do some work on there. But like the interior fit and finish on both, just some really neat accents. Mike, I know you'll eventually rate it when we get one, but some geometric backlit armrests and the quilted... Uh, you know, leather seats, just some real niceties, other things that you've I've never seen before. You have the ability to adjust the front passenger seat from the driver's side. So how many times have you leaned over and tried to, you know, yeah. give some a rear seat passenger more leg room? You can do that from the driver's seat. A kid, you know, you have a kid That's back there. That's why they do that? I thought that was just so you can, you know, mess with your passenger. No, but isn't that so <laughs> oh. nice? Have you ever seen that? It's such like, so simple, yet so great. The other thing I do want to add on the child passenger safety side is the GV70 is the first vehicle, certainly, that we've seen that will have an integrated radar-based, not ultrasonic, radar sensor for detecting the presence of children or pets even that are left in these hot vehicles, kind of an occupant um, detection system. The promise of this one and what makes it different is not that it just detects movement, but the radar is sensitive enough that it would even detect, say, a, a, a small child or an infant's respiration. So it can even get those kind of fine movements. So we have great hopes for all of this technology. We're really fortunate this year. If you look at the number of kids in hot cars deaths, there's only 10 in 2021 versus um, 25 in 2020, 53 in 2018 and 2019. So less driving. Um, I'm hoping you know, one of the silver linings of COVID is maybe people feel less harried and they're not rushing off to work and commutes, or maybe even some of the education on this topic is setting in and people are realizing how dangerous it is, but only 10 and we're up to August. So there was, there were some really good things and nice things about the GV70. Right. Right. Obviously 10 more than, than we want, or there should be, but progress is important. So, um, yeah, I think overall, uh, this is a sporty driving, stylish SUV. And kind of to your point, Jen, about the interior and just how nice it looks. Uh, it's an SUV that I think you'd be proud to own. You know what I mean? And and yes, it doesn't have a Mercedes or a BMW badge. Who cares? And actually, I think the Genesis badge is actually gaining some real traction as as this is a, a really solid luxury brand. Like proud we to said, own and proud to show off. 
I think, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. It feels special. I'm, it does. It but, really does. Yeah. And that's why I, my point of being, I think you'd be, you'd be proud to own it, you know, and that's, that's important. And uh, like I said, we will be buying one very soon. Uh, stay tuned for full road test results. Uh, in the meantime, go to consumerreports.org and check out our first drive with uh, a lot more in-depth information than we just talked about right now. Uh, let's take a giving moment for a second, if you guys don't mind, and talk about the Talking Cars donation program. Uh, you know, if you don't know, Consumer Reports is a nonprofit organization. Everything that we do is funded by memberships as well as donations. So any little bit you can do goes a long way, helps us to do the good work that we do here at Consumer Reports, including putting out this podcast. So you can find more info at cr.org slash give talking cars. And we thank you so much. Let's move on to audience questions. Uh, don't forget to send those questions, comments, 30 second video clips to talking cars at iCloud.com. Uh, we do love those video clips you send to us. We love seeing your faces and all your great questions. And the first one today comes from Darnley from Yonkers, New York. Let's see what Darnley has to say. Hey, Consumer Reports. I recently took my Mazda CX-9 for service and uh, they told me that uh, my rear brakes, they're good for now. They're kind of in the yellow. So I'm assuming next time I go, they're probably going to want to put on new rear brakes. I was going to go to another place and order my own brakes for this car. And I asked him if I do that, would you put them on? He said, yes, but we won't guarantee them. I said, that's not a problem. Do you recommend going outside and getting brakes from someplace else and having them installed at the dealership instead of having them put what they want to put on and charging you more money? Let me know. Thanks. All right, Jen, uh, do you have an answer for Darnley? Yeah, so um, I got to be honest. I reached out to John Ibbotson, our chief mechanic at, at the track. I got schooled on brakes, so <laughs> really? much so that I emailed him the questions I had about Darnley's um, questions. And he texts me back and says, call me. I can't put all of this in an email. <laughs> it was so. So let me just walk through. And I did take some notes. First of all, we may be old enough or DIY enough that we still think about replacing pads only. John says, gone are the days when you just replace brake pads. It's really? always, yes. And no dealer or um, bigger independent repair shop, you'll, you're likely never going to get just pads only. It's always going to be a pad and rotor replacement. Why? And the reason yeah, is, is the reason? that they take such a embedded set together that when you put a new pad on an even slightly imperfect rotor, that you're likely walking yourselves right into a noise issue, a brake noise hmm. issue. Even if it's just, you know, we think of warped and, and really gouged rotors. He says it doesn't even have to be that. And rotors have become much more of an expendable part. They don't have the thickness where we used to turn them, you know, to smooth them out. They don't have that thickness anymore. They're meant to be as a pair. And while we might do it on older cars or what we're doing in our own garages, mm -hmm. most shops will not do that. And it sounded like Darnley may have known that, you know, when he talked about it. The second thing is that Darnley alluded to, replacement of rear brake sets may be more expensive than the fronts because they've been complicated by the electronic parking brake. So to get oh. that piston retracted from this electronic parking brake, you have to go through um, putting the vehicle in a service mode to get that parking brake to pull back so you can work on your own um, rear brakes. So you need to have someone who knows what they're doing, who can't knows how to put that car in service mode. He actually alluded to, you know, putting it in a tow mode, but this time you have to put it in a service mode for a brake job. When John Darnley alluded to the brakes being in the yellow, and I was, I got to admit, I'm like, what does he mean by in the yellow? John said that could be two things. The garage or, Ma, or you know, in this case, the Mazda may have a gauge that indicates red, yellow, green for the pad depth. It also may be simply the inspection sheet that has, you know, they're doing their multi-point inspection. Here's things that are green. Here's things that are yellow on the sheet that you may want to be thinking about for your next service appointment again, schooled. And depending, John says that yellow could be anything from half worn to a little more. And if you know the rate, you know, you know, when your car was new, 
how far did you get on those pads for the miles you've driven, kind of the rate of wear on the pads. He said, you may be looking at only half worn and still them showing yellow. So for his specific question, yes, you can get aftermarket parts. To his point, yes, you can take them to the dealer. They won't um, necessarily certify them or um, warranty them. John said, however, brakes are a great opportunity if you're looking to save a little money by working with an independent um knowledgeable garage. Again, we've just said all the reasons they need to be knowledgeable, but it's a great job to bring to an independent repair shop, get a relationship going. It's not something the dealer necessarily has to do. There's so many things like we talked about, electronics, computers, et cetera, that you can only go to the dealer. Why not develop a relationship with an independent um, repair shop? Um, Let them do the breaks. Again, make sure they're knowledgeable. It doesn't matter. I mean, some people are just saying, I'm always going to go to the dealer, which is fine, but you are going to pay more. So maybe take the opportunity for something like brakes to to have an option for saving a little money in terms of labor costs. But it's it's going to be labor costs. And I I was just schooled on the whole topic. I thought it was a great answer. Thank you, John. Um, but always get someone who knows what they're doing on a yeah, newer thank, vehicle thank, like Darnley's CX-9. Thank you, Jen, for doing the research and, and telling us because I know... Alex and I both learned something today here, too. So, All right, let's move on to David from Dallas, Texas. David says, I am a proud owner of a 2020 Ford Escape with a three-cylinder turbo engine and have had good luck with it. I usually drive my car in sport mode, which keeps my engine revving higher and my transmission in lower gears. This option gives the engine a much noticeable increase in power. I enjoy this feature and use it often, but will the sport mode wear out an engine faster over time versus driving in normal mode? Uh, I also checked with Big John, as Jen did, our you know chief mechanic, and he said there will be no measurable difference in wear between the modes, uh, but he did say there will be a difference in fuel economy. So as far as wear and tear, don't worry about that. But if you want to, uh, if you notice your fuel economy going down a little bit, it could be because you have it in sport mode. So, but don't worry about the um, longevity anyway, as far as that. Uh, we have the next one is, is kind of uh, a couple questions kind of on the same topic. So I'm going to read both questions and then we'll try and see if we can get them answered for you. The first one is Rick from Chesapeake, Virginia. I recently saw a Facebook ad for undercoating, which I have seen offered as a dealership add on. I don't see cars with rusting issues like we used to have years ago. The last car I had with undercoating was my 83 Malibu, but the ads show varying degrees of rusting underneath the car. What are your thoughts on undercoating these days? A waste of time and money? Bill from Pittsburgh, uh, along those same lines, says, can you weigh in on fluid film, wool wax, or other undercoatings, please? I want my new car to last many years. So, Alex, uh, what is the deal with uh, rust proofing or undercoating you can put on yourself? Yeah, I I love this question because, you know, as and we all do it driving old cars in the northeast you're always trying to like prevent rust and it, maybe you just don't drive it in the winter but if you do you're trying to figure out how to how to stop the corrosion so um and we've answered this question before right monty on a, yep. on a previous episode but um in a little bit of a different way but so i would say to uh focus on rick's question first um any any undercoating you know advertised to you for a new car, like either from the dealer or even just a independent place when the car is new, um, probably not worth your time or effort because cars have just gotten so much better in terms of not only the undercoating that they already come with from the factory, you know, 99% of cars, but also even just the steel that's used to manufacture cars now are literally better at resisting uh, corrosion. So I would say don't, don't bother with that. Um, you also have to be careful because a new car comes with a warranty and you don't want to spray anything on the underside of the car that might damage components or get into the electrical system or whatever it is that, and void your warranty. That would be worse than the corrosion you're trying to prevent um, down the road. And and also, if you were to do any undercoating, it's very important that you do it when the car is essentially as new as possible, because if you were to spray on like a permanent coating, like a rubber coating or anything on top of rust that's already there. You're just trapping that rust and it's just going to accelerate the problem and make it worse. You're better off leaving if there's like surface rust on the frame of your car or something. You're better off not touching that with like a rubberized coating that that might be advertised to you. 
Um, and then to answer Bill's question, um, he's spot on. Um, and I actually personally use fluid film on, on my old, uh, Toyota to try to protect it in the winter. And this is a, a natural, um, substance basically that you can spray onto the frame and it's a once a year type of application, maybe November time spray it on, at least in the Northeast spray it on. And it's going to just not allow, um, kind of a barrier between the frame and, and the salt and corrosion and all that. Right. And you can actually rinse it off, um, with low pressure, take the hose and just kind of rinse any stuff that collects under the underside of your car and get that to, to, to wash away. So, and I think, uh, other than using something like fluid film, just it's important to wash your car throughout the, the winter months, right? Don't wait until, uh, you know, May rolls around or something like that to give it its first wash. Try to get it, you know, throughout the, the season and whether you do it yourself or you take it to an undercarriage wash, um, you know, that'll, that'll help definitely help a lot too along the way. Yeah. You got to keep, you got to keep on top of that salt. If you're in an area uh, like where we live, where, where they do use salt on the roads that can be very harmful to the car. All right. Yep. Great answer, Alex. Thank you for that. Uh, let's go to the last question. This comes from Henry from New York city. Henry says your show prompted me to subscribe to consumer reports. Thank you, Henry. And now CR is part of my research and shopping for everything. So thank you. I do 90% of my driving in the city but I have a cabin in the woods 400 miles away with 10 miles of rutted dirt roads. I've had SUVs for years, vehicles that can do both the city stuff and the dirt roads, but it's wasteful. I'm going to get a PHEV for the city driving and need help finding a 4x4 to leave garaged in the woods. Can you recommend a reliable, fun, used 4x4 in the, in the $10,000 range? My family will also use it, so it should have ABS, airbags, stability control, and can't be breaking down twice a month in the woods. So no classic Range Rovers. Thank you. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there before we even get to the question, which is, first of all, the no classic Range Rovers in your face. Uh, Ryan Pizlkowski and Mike Quincy from last episode, because that was yeah, right. one of the, the um, S classic SUVs that they picked. Um, Henry's right, though. <laughs> yeah. Also, uh, I'm so jealous. 400 miles away from the city. Uh with 10 miles of dirt roads, I think, to get to the cabin. I mean, that is way out in the boondocks. And uh, I love the sound of that. But we do we are here to answer questions. So let's start with Jen. What kind of a good use 4x4 can you recommend for Henry? Yeah, I could appreciate I live on a dirt road and the house in Vermont is on a dirt road. 10 miles of dirt road. That's a lot of dirt <laughs> yeah. road to drive. But um, so I had a cheat because I work on those best cars for young drivers. And the link to um, the question was that all of those vehicles on those lists have standard stability control. So, and they're used and they're top notch for reliability and road tests. So I kind of had a cheat because I referred to that list first. It's a tough ask at the $10,000 mm -hmm. mark where he mm -hmm. wants to be to get the stability control standard. And we say standard, you can search for one. Many vehicles had it optional, but it's much easier to look for model years where you know it's on there, where rather than having to dig through a VIN or find an old sticker and see if it had it. So um, with that said, I also honed in on his idea of fun. Um, and the ones from that list were an Acura RDX actually. So a mm. little bit smaller, 2011 for the $10,000 range. If you wanted to go a little bit higher, you can get 2012 to 14. Um, used cars are a little crazy right now, as we've talked about at length. A little less fun, but maybe more functional for a family is the Toyota Highlander. Um, 2008 to 2013 is sub $15,000 range. Um, all of those vehicles had stability control uh, Toyota vehicles long before it was required. So you, mm -hmm. you just get it in those earlier years as standard equipment. Um, so, yeah. All right. Good picks. Uh, Alex, what do you have? Yeah, this is another great question. So anybody who knows me is probably expecting me to say like a third gen forerunner or something. That's like the 96 just, to 02. <laughs> that's what I figured you would say. <laughs> but close. But I'm going to say the fourth generation forerunner is, is my choice. So that's 03 to 09, I believe is the, the span. Um, and so Toyota reliability, um, it's some of the, you know, it's going to have a pretty robust four wheel drive system for those 10 miles on the dirt road. Uh, the fun aspect of it, it does have the kind of forerunner trademark thing of the rear window that folds down or rolls down into the tailgate, right? So that 
gives it a little bit of a unique experience. I would say, you know, if you can, and I did try to look up some prices ahead of time. And like Jen said, the market is crazy and it's even a tough ass to begin with at that price range. But um, if you can get a 2006 or newer with the V6, they're generally a little more reliable. But and I'm not sure if it's standard, as Jen mentioned, but you definitely can get stability control on this vehicle. So that's need is is met there. I just the last comment on that is with any vehicle, whether it's a forerunner or whatever it is, just in the Northeast, if and that's where you are, just be mindful of any rust on a on an older four by four. We talked about it before. So just be mindful of that when you're doing your shopping. I right. want to, I want to add to Mike. It, it might not be what car he picks, but how he stores it. You know, he said yeah. garaged, so you got to make sure your garage tight. I would worry yeah. about squirrels and rats and mice getting in those wires if he's not going there frequently. And mm-hmm. and there's things like peppermint spray or or rodent um, deterring tape or even the ultrasonic sensors. That's what we use in Vermont to keep the mice out. <laughs> so oh, there's cool. all these things, but you, I would worry and make sure you're checking on that too when you do go back to the cabin and, and are checking in on it. Uh, so to your point, Jen, about the rodents, yeah, that is a, a you know, if you're storing something for a long period of time, uh, we do ha- have some stories about that up on our website if you want to check it out with uh, some really good tips. How to protect your car from rodents. CR offers clever solutions to critters nibbling at your wires. But I feel like, I feel like we forgot something here. What do you guys think we forgot on this topic? Your suggestion. Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Alex. At least someone cares around here. <laughs> Jen just moves on to rodents. Who cares about Monty's No, pick? no, I'm very interested. Very interested. Oh, sure. Because you, you have a cabin <laughs> in the woods. Yeah. Um, so my pick's a little, a little out there. Not quite Mike Quincy out there, but uh, so I'm suggesting an older Lexus GX. Uh, you know, this would be like 2008 or a little older. Um, this is a really good off-road vehicle. I actually have two buddies that over the last several years have bought uh, a GX. Each one has bought a, a used GX and they've taken them off-road. They're fantastic off-roaders. I mean, they're kind of a little bit luxurious too. Uh, and, you know, really good reliability. So that's what, that would be my pick for something interesting, especially with all that, with 10 miles of dirt roads. If I don't know if that's 10 miles to get to the cabin or if there's just 10 miles of dirt roads they generally drive on around the cabin. But that's just a good, solid, strong vehicle that's going to be able to soak up those uh, those dirt roads like nothing. So Yeah, and, and I did say, assume with my RDX and my Highlander that the roads are in decent shape. But you're right. If, if, if they're rutted or, mm-hmm. you know, mud season – then you might need something closer to what you're saying or, or the forerunner yeah. with a little more clearance, a little more off-road-ish. Jen, your, your picks are still good, Jen. Right. I'm just saying. All right. We gave them choices. Yeah. All right. Anyway, that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, if you want to learn more about the cars and the topics we talked about, you can click on the links in the show notes. Don't forget to send those questions, comments, and 30-second video clips to TalkingCars at iCloud.com. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you all next week. out there.